she puts the wow, mmm, yum, into words. It's the Lafayette Food Junkie herself on News Talk 96.5 KPL. Welcome back to the Lafayette Food Junkie Show on News Talk 96.5 KPL. Here we talk about all the food happenings around Acadiana. If you like food, tune in. You might learn something new. Welcome back, guys and dolls. Uh, I am in Austin right now. Uh, so on next week's show, you're going to be hearing all about the great food in Austin. Uh, I've tried to ma- make it my goal this trip to um, only eat at food trucks. So we're going to see how well that works out. And you'll hear more about that next week. Uh, But this week, um, we decided to take a look back at some of the interviews that we've done here on the Lafayette Food Junkie Show and kind of give an updated um, perspective on some of the interviews here. Uh, But my first interview that you're going to be listening to is with Chef Paul Gibson. He won third place in the Louisiana Seafood Cook-Off that happened uh, about a month ago. And he is the executive chef of Palm Bro in Brobridge, Louisiana. And if any of you out there um, remember Bonnie Bell's Bistro uh, back in Lafayette, it was kind of, it happened right before um, the, the, the foodie scene kind of happened in town. And um, it, it, you could probably classify it as one of those restaurants that had it opened a little bit later um, when, when the food craze kind of happened in town. It might have been a little successful. So you, you could cl- kind of classify it as a little ahead of its time, um, but he was the the chef and owner of Bonnie Bell's Bistro, um, and I'm kind of in love with his hamburger uh, that they have on the menu right now. Uh, if, if for any reason you should go out to Pomp Rose in Bro Bridge and check out that hamburger, it's wonderful. But here is my interview with Chef Paul Gibson. We are sitting down with executive chef Paul Gibson of Point Bros Cajun Restaurant. Uh, That is right off of the old Burbridge Highway if you're coming from Lafayette. And he recently won third place in the Louisiana Seafood Competition that took part with the Taste of Eat Lafayette event. Uh, Thanks for joining us. Well, thank you for having me. I'd just like to say third place. Hey, there are no losers in food, and that dish is delicious. We're going to talk about that a little later. But tell us a little bit about your culinary background. Um, Let's see. I've been in the industry uh, going on a little over 30 years, Uh, kind of the same story. I started out as 16 dishwasher, worked my way up. I went in the Army for about 10 years, all cooking, and uh, I've always had a passion and wanted to be a chef. And when I got out of the military, came back home, I got a chance to pursue that. Uh, Probably my first gig was actually at Charlie G's. Wow. Okay. So I feel like so many established chefs in town have have gone through Charlie G's. What do you think you learned the most from working there? Um, Probably a couple of the best things is uh, I was able to work with fine ingredients for the first time. Um, that and they at that time you got to understand this was 2000 um, they they gave us the freedom as long as we didn't mess anything up because the ingredients were expensive so you had the freedom of both ends to use great ingredients and say okay what can I come up with and that's what I really enjoyed the most about it and you owned and operated Bonnie Bell's Bistro, which has a very loyal following. I know when they when you guys closed the doors, a lot of people were upset about it. And you still have um, a lot of loyal customers that love that restaurant. Yes. <laughs> okay, so anyone... So Bonnie Bell's was a little before my time because I remember um, it was open. So it used to be where St. Street Inn is now. It was on campus, and I believe that it was open while I was in a broke college student, so I didn't get to go there a lot. But then you guys also opened later on downtown uh, where Pops Po' Boys is now. So tell us a little bit about what the menu was like at Bonnie Bell's Bistro. Uh, well, in the beginning, uh, well, the whole idea of the restaurant was to uh, great food, great service at a great price. And in order to do that, we needed customers to come back two, even three times a week. 
So uh, we really had to work hard at that, and we were able to do that, accomplish it. Um, I had actually just finished a stint at Charlie G's, so I was actually trying to find that happy medium because I couldn't use the expensive ingredients. I didn't want to use uh, lesser in, so I found a medium way to do it and to produce a great product, and that's what we were about uh, the whole 10 years that we were open. Uh, then when we moved to the bigger location, I started getting into a little Southwest theme. Uh, just, I just enjoyed it, the chilies and the peppers and just making those seasonings and everything like that, the salsas and all that good stuff. So I started pairing that with the dishes that I uh, would come up with. And, um, I mean, the take on was basically, I called it continental because it was a little bit of everything. So we had talked about, uh, before I started the interview, Bonnie Bell's was was maybe a little ahead of its time, like a few other restaurants here in Acadiana that kind of opened up that were really cool and maybe didn't do so well at the time before the culinary explosion kind of happened in town. Uh, do you think if you were open now that the, the client would be, the client, the climate would be a little bit different? Um, I, I think so. I mean, we, we had, uh, uh, our clientele was foodies. Mm-hmm. Uh, it really was. Yeah, so it was ahead of, of yeah, its time. Yeah, yeah I, it, it was. Uh, I mean, we had a great clientele. Uh, my wife, uh, the joke was she used to have to reel me in, you know, because I'd always say, hey, I got a great idea. So I had to try it out on her, and she'd be like, eh, you know, maybe not yet, or, you know, let's wait on this. So um, I think now the idea is... Even some of the stuff I did back then would, yeah, would go very well now. And just like a couple of the things I showed you earlier, you know, would too. Because I, I love the main thing. I wanted the plate to speak for itself. I didn't want to use garnish. I wanted the plate to be so beautiful. You didn't need to garnish it. So by using bright colors and and food and cooking it the proper way, you just look at it and be like, oh wow. So that was the whole idea of that. And and still now it is. So you came to Point Bros in January as executive chef. What have been some of the changes that you've made on the menu? Everything. No, I'm just playing. <laughs> um, I've changed about uh, close to everything. Uh, some things I tweaked uh, kind of brought the food a little more updated, I guess you'd say. Put some items on there. I'm trying to stay true to the uh, Cajun roots and everything, but I'm trying to do what I call Cajun my way. Just take Cajun ingredients and come up with something different. Uh, okay, so let's talk about the burger that I just tried, which I believe now is my new... It has dethroned my favorite burgers and has now taken first place in my favorite burger um, in Acadiana. So tell us a little bit about that burger. That burger is a bourbon steak burger. It is our trimmings from our ribeye and filet, grind up, <clears throat> no filler, no nothing at it. Uh, we season it with the season all. Uh, we use a local bakery for the bread, which is Champagne's. We have a uh, roasted garlic mayonnaise that we make in house. Um, have bourbon glaze, applewood smoked bacon, grilled onions, mushrooms, and some cheddar cheese on it. And it just speaks for itself. You do need a ton of napkins to eat it. But as you said, uh, a good burger, a good sandwich is not a good burger or sandwich unless you need a ton of napkins. Exactly. If everything is holding in together, to me, it's just not right. I mean, you don't want it dripping down your arm. Well, maybe you do. I know I, I do. But not everybody likes that. But still, it, it should hold together, but still should be coming out at the same time, if that makes any sense. To me, that's a good sandwich, good burger, anything of that nature. That way, the ingredients are just, you have enough. It's not compact to where like, you're looking for bacon or anything of that nature. Okay, so let's also talk about your third place winner for the Louisiana Seafood Competition. <laughs> I just I had the pleasure of, of tasting it, and it's delicious. What I loved about it, I love the beet chips that are on the top, but I also appreciated that you made a use for the beet greens and incorporated that into the dish as well. Well, actually, it was the beet greens, and I added the beets to it. It was kind of the opposite, yeah. I know. Uh, in fact, I actually... Um my mother gave me that idea because she had, my mother loves beets and she had asked me, she said, well, what are you doing with the beets? And I said, well, I'm going to cook them later, you know, from his Jerry or something. She says, well, won't you try to do something with it? I said, okay. So 
took the beet and I said, well, what can I do with it? And then I said, ooh, let's try to shave it and fry it. And then we did, and it came out crispy, and I was like, there's the garnish. It ended up being simple, but I hadn't even thought about it, to be honest with you, until good old mom did. So the dish also has purple potatoes, which if you're listening and you're like, ooh, it tastes exactly like a regular potato. It's just a little more um, visually stunning to the eye. Right. It's a purple fingerling potato uh, with tasso. We have some uh, sautéed onions and bell peppers, uh, red peppers, excuse me, and some other secret ingredients that I can't tell you. But if you got the program, you can read the whole uh, recipe, so it's not that much of a secret, is it? Uh, the beet greens I did, I kept real simple with it. I uh, sautéed it in baking fat. I mean, doesn't get any better. Uh, a little salt and pepper on it. I wanted the integrity of the greens to stand out instead of smothering it down with, you know, seasoning. And uh, I think the item that made the dish what it is is the corn mock shoe sauce. That's got to be my top two sauces I've ever made. I mean, when I came up with that, I said, this is just too simple. Why nobody else ever did it? And I said, well, maybe that's the thing. It's too simple, you know. But it, it came out so good, I was just like, I'm going to use it. So that menu item is on it's a special right now. Um, do you have any idea how long it's going to be on the menu for people to come on over and, and try it before it leaves the menu? Well, we're running as a special, not a menu item. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, no, not right now. I'm not sure. We're just going to run it on probably usually on the weekends uh, till it, it doesn't sell. <laughs> I hear that. Um, any new upcoming items that you kind of want to tease that you might that might be making a, an appearance as a special? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we we like we like to ask the chefs that come on the show um, two very important questions. Actually, three three important questions. Uh, first one is post favorite post shift drink. Coca Cola. I'm not a big drinker. Okay, and I, I think that that is the most um, tame answer <laughs> that we've gotten on the show. Um, okay, so death row meal, meaning the last meal that you would ever have on this earth, what would you want it to be? My mother's spaghetti. Nice. That's a lot of uh, mother dishes She's we get. Italian, so you can't get better than that. Okay, and then this is a very uh, Cajun, Acadiana. Who makes your favorite boudin? <laughs> um, oh, man. Me. <laughs> Do you really make food out? Well, we're about to start. Okay. Um, but right now, uh, we buy from Reed Street. And I don't know if I should say this, but I kind of add some stuff to it for our boudin balls. Uh, it's a, a bacon boudin balls is what we make, but there's some secrets in it that brings it out. Uh, but I mean, I mean, they have good boudin regardless, but I just add a little extra to it. So, yeah, I'm a little biased, huh? <laughs> Chef Gibson, thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you very much for having me. And now we talk about food. It's the Lafayette Food Junkie Show on News Talk 96.5 KPL. Our next interview was with Noah at Good Waffle. I had went out to the farmer's market one day and did a bunch of farmer's market interviews. And I really liked them because they were college students. And the way that the business got started was as a class project uh, for the class that he was taking that semester. Uh, they were at the farmer's market for a while. They took a hiatus. Uh, but they are now back at the farmer's market. Um, so here is my interview with Noah from Good Waffle. Welcome back to the Lafayette Food Junkie Show on News Talk 96.5 KPEL. I'm your host, Tiffany Deku, and we've been doing a live recorded show from the Lafayette Farmers and Artisans Market here at Muncus Park. Uh, it's been really enjoyable. Some great smells. I wish the radio show had smell vision right now so you guys could smell it. And talking about good smells, um, I'm right in front of Good Waffle, and joining us now is Noah with Good Waffle, uh, who is bringing waffles to the Lafayette market. It's something very different. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me on the show. Okay, so how did the idea come about? So basically me and my friend uh, Nick, we go to UL, and we were basically thinking, like, what could we do? Because we're both business majors. Like, what could we do to kind of get our feet wet in business and uh we found we went to san diego and found a place called wow wow waffle that served these kind of waffles and we found out they had no 
they had nowhere in Lafayette that even came close to those kind of waffles. So we really just wanted to, you know, uh, get some experience and have some fun and make some awesome waffles. Okay, so what makes these waffles different? Oh, great question. So they are a Liège Belgian waffle, which is a dough instead of a batter. So uh, usually you'll pour a batter into a waffle iron. But these waffles, we have to make a dough, let it rise, and then we add in Belgian pearl sugar, which gives it a sweet uh, taste. So it's unlike any other waffle. Uh, I had my first Belgian waffle at a waffle place in Alexandria, and he had to come and school me because I was eating the waffle incorrectly. So these are eaten a little bit different than what you imagine a normal, well, what we consider normal waffle would be eaten like. Yeah, of course. So to eat a good waffle, you have to be a classy person, you know, so you have to really eat it with your pinky out or else it really ruins the whole experience, you know. And he's joking, folks. That is not true. (laughs) That's not true. But, you know, it's uh, it's definitely not like an, a normal waffle, but you do have to have a fork and knife. I think his point was don't smother it in syrup. Yes, no syrup allowed at Good Waffle. Okay, so, so what are some of the different waffles that you guys have on the menu, and does the menu change? Yeah, so we've been, we've been uh, kind of finding the right menu, but our most pop- popular one that's a sweet waffle would probably be the cinnamon waffle, which is cinnamon, brown sugar, and, and homemade whipped cream, and then the back to the fruiture, which is... Um, white chocolate chips, strawberries, blueberries, homemade whipped cream, and homemade caramel. And then um, we also have a new boudin waffle, which is really incredible. Okay, so where do you get the boudin from? We get it from Best Stop, only the best. Okay, I approve of that. Uh, I I feel like that should be at the upcoming boudin cook-off. I mean, I... You know, I'm just getting into the boudin game, so uh, we're kind of like testing the waters and seeing where we're going with it, you know? So you have a, a nice little mix of savory and sweet. What has been the best sellers? Uh, so the best seller would probably be the Back to the Fruiture, and um, I think it's because of its great name and then also its great taste. Okay. So right now you guys are at the farmer's market. Do you have plans to expand, maybe get a brick and mortar location, maybe a food truck location? Yeah. So we just bought a 1968 vintage Shasta trailer. And um, right now it's a piece of work. But uh, so it's basically a really old camper trailer and we're trying to fix it up and turn it into a food trailer currently. But that'll take months and uh, we're doing all the work ourselves currently. That's exciting. You guys heard it here first. So y'all are very active on social media. So where can people go to find more information on Good Waffle? Hashtag Good Waffle Co. Hashtag uh, It's All Good. So if you, we have Facebook and Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, YouTube. We don't really have all that. We have Facebook and Instagram, but at Good Waffle Co. All right. Thank you so much for talking to me this morning. It smells so good. It's all good. Yeah, for sure. Y'all come check us out every Saturday from 8 to 12. The best tasting radio show in all of South Louisiana. It's the Lafayette Food Junkie Show on News Talk 96.5 KPL. Welcome back to the Lafayette Food Junkie Show on News Talk 96.5 KPL. I'm your host, Tiffany Deku. And we're looking back at some past interviews that we've done um, throughout the history of the Lafayette Food Junkie radio show. This next one is also going to be from the farmer's market. Uh, I went out there and did some interviews. And this one was with Mr. Snow Vincent of Santa Rita Honey. And sadly, he has passed away. Um, but he was a very familiar and welcoming face at the farmer's market. And we're going to take a look back at the interview that I did with him. So here's my interview with Mr. Snow Vincent of Santa Rita Honey. Welcome back to the Lafayette Food Junkie Show on News Talk 96.5 KPL. I'm your host, Tiffany Deku, and we are doing a special on-location episode of the Lafayette Food Junkie Radio Show. We are out here at the Lafayette Farmers and Artisans Market here at Muckus Park. And I do want to mention really quickly, we were talking to EB earlier in the show about the different things that are happening at the, the horse farm. Uh, they're going to be having the taco festival here on October 28th, so tickets are still available for that, and you guys can go out and and what better way to eat tacos than in this in this beautiful surrounding? Uh, joining me now is Snow Vincent with Santa Rita Honey. I will say this is his first time on the show, but he has been mentioned several times on the show by the other vendors of the market. Most recently, Melissa Leonard with Let the Good Nosh Roll went on a five-minute tangent about how amazing you were and how amazing your honey was. Um, she just could 
kept going on and on about it. So thank you so much for joining us this morning. But thank you very much for having us. Okay, so how did the honey start? We started in 2004. Uh, my son had planted a garden and uh, he had a lot of flowers and no vegetables. He said, came, came to me and he said, uh, Dad, I think uh, we need some bees. So I said, okay. And I just more or less kind of retired. But uh, anyway, we decided to get into the honeybee business. And uh, we bought uh, 65 three-pound uh, containers of bees with the queen and had enough uh, boxes to make about 500 boxes of uh, uh, bee boxes. And uh, so we started out with 65 hives, and, uh, and that's how we got started. How hard is it to harvest honey? And take us a little bit through that process. Well, it's uh, it's probably during the heat of the day in, in the summertime, and uh, it's really hot. But we uh, have uh, supers on top of the, the deep boxes that uh, we collect all the honey from. And uh, we go in at a... a, a, a it's a fume box that runs the bees out, and we take the supers and bring them to the to the honey house and spin them uh, out on a uncap them on an uncapping tank, spin them out on a centrifuge, and then uh, strain the uh, the honey in a uh, a five gallon bucket, and then put it in the bottling tank, and from that uh, system, then we go to the market with it. So I see different products that you have with the honey. What are some of the products that I'm seeing behind us? Well, we have uh, the uh, regular honey, and then we have uh, cut cone in, in honey, and have cut cone in round, and we have uh, uh, the, uh, it's the... Uh, Granola. Granola, honey yeah. granola. I'm sorry. That's okay. But in, anyway... Uh, and my wife makes that, and uh, it's really a good product, and uh, that's 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 it. What's the difference between the honey that has the comb in it and the honey that does not have the comb in it? It's really not that much difference, but uh, the uh, people like to chew the comb. Okay. It's it's all it is is beeswax, and uh, and uh, then they uh, usually spit out the beeswax after they chew the honey out of it. But uh, it, it's it's really a, a a commodity that they like. So I was told long ago that if you have allergies, especially seasonal allergies, that it was helpful to start eating locally made honey because it would help you get over the allergies. I don't know how much you know about that, but I was, I'm was i just mentioning that right now because we're talking about honey. You take a tablespoon a day uh-huh. and it doesn't make any difference how you take it, either straight or in coffee or peanut butter or anything a day and... Uh, do it continuously and it will help with the allergies okay so there is some fact behind that that is very good to know how does it make you feel to know how much the other vendors love your honey and and say such good things ab- about the product that you're putting out well the honey sells itself it's it's raw honey we we heat it, only heat it up to about 100 degrees to be able to bottle it good uh easy and uh, it's raw honey, and it's not anything like you buy out of the store from different parts of the country. It's uh, It has a real good flavor and taste, and uh, it's really good for you. And so you guys are only sell exclusively at this market, and then the Lake Charles Cash and Carry Market, is that correct? And also some stores around okay. Lake Charles. Okay. Well, that is good to know. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Oh, thank you for having us in uh we're out here. We try to be out here every Saturday, unless the weather is bad. So it's a pretty good drive from Lake Charles, but uh, we enjoy coming out here. All right. We are going to take another break. And when we come back, we have another vendor from the market. So come back to us. It's the Lafayette Food Junkie Show on Newstock 96.5 KPL. From Boudin to the best burgers Acadiana has to offer, it's the Lafayette Food Junkie Show on News Talk 96.5 KPEL. One of the highlights of my career was when I got invited to do a food media tour of Shreveport, Louisiana, which, uh, as many of you know who's, who's listened to the show for a long time, that is my hometown area. 
And it was really humbling and nice to be able to see my hometown, which I haven't really got to experience a whole lot uh, for the first time. And it kind of opened my eyes and made me aware of some of the culinary traditions that are happening around the state. Um, One of the people that I got to interview on that tour was Mr. Harvey with Real Good Barbecue. Um, And as, as I have a theory that anyone who runs a barbecue joint is kind of very wise, and I think it has to do with getting up so early and sitting there with the roasting meat. Um, But we sat down and talked to him about barbecue. And this is my interview with Mr. Harvey with Real Good Barbecue. We're talking with Mr. Harvey Clay at Real Barbecue here in Shreveport, Louisiana. And I have to say, I just finished a massive barbecue meal. It was so much meat and it was so delicious. And I just wanted to take a minute and, and talk to him because Chris J said that he considers you a spiritual advisor as well as pit master. Yeah. Uh, how, how did you know that barbecue and you were meant to be? Well, first of all, because I loved it. And because I loved it, I thought that's a great thing to share with people. Because whatever you do, I want to see people happy. It's not just about getting paid. It's about having joy. And the only thing I think God could have left me here to do was to help make it a better world. I haven't been that good. So I have a debt of trying to make the world better. And because I love barbecue, and most people like barbecue, and it's hard to find good barbecue, let alone great barbecue. And when people kept telling me that they really liked it, it gave me more inspiration to go further and further into barbecue. So this is a Texas-style barbecue, is that correct? How would you describe Texas-style barbecue? Well, first of all, it's very slow cooked. We use a combination of a little bit of oak, we use uh, some pecan, and a little bit of hickory. Most of the time I grew up on, we used mesquite because that's all we have. But it's to keep the temperature low. You know, we do 175 to 200, generally speaking. Every once in a while we get up to 300, but generally 175 to 200. And just take your time and try to make sure that you're cooking with love. You want smoke in the meat, not just cooked. Otherwise you can just put it in the oven. But if you don't have the smoke, you don't have the, the barbecue. That's what the flavor is. And I love it. I even like it just to see the grill smoke. I mean, I like it. So I have to say, it smells amazing in here. It smells like smoke. You can definitely taste the love in your food. You, you do a brisket-style sausage that reminded me of a Mexican chorizo. You want to tell us a little bit about how you make that? Well, we take a fresh brisket. We send it out to a meat plant in West Texas. And they grind the brisket, and they, they put it into a collagen casing. They pre-smoke it in a USDA plant, inspector's plant, and when they pre-smoke it, the casing melts away, so it's a skinless brisket sausage with no preservatives, no junk, no organ meat, no pork skin, no pork fat, just brisket and the seasoning that we blend. And so it's a very tasty sausage. It's not too hot, but a little bit of warmth to it, but with good meat and great seasonings. Can you also tell us about... So one thing we discovered, you have these glorious, massive, the size of my head, baked potatoes on the menu that not only have the meat, but also has macaroni and cheese. Are are those very popular in the restaurant? Really popular. One of the things that happened, people would ask for a baked potato with brisket or sausage or turkey or chicken, and then ask for a side of macaroni and cheese. So we had one that we, first one we did, we did it with double rib tips and macaroni and cheese on top. And we put the macaroni and cheese on top, it looked like a halo. So we called it a saint. People thought it was for the New Orleans saints. It applies because we are in New Orleans, but it was really dumb because it looked like a halo with that macaroni and cheese on top. And that's because of people taught us to do that. If you listen to customers, they'll usually tell you what they want. And so we just followed their lead and complied. So I have a question that you may or may not have some insight into. It's a it's an ongoing debate. Um, I'm based out of Lafayette, Louisiana. We, we, we do not have good barbecue in Lafayette, and we cannot for the life of us figure out why we don't have good barbecue in Lafayette. I don't know how familiar you are with South Louisiana, if you have any insight into why that might be, but uh, it's it's something that it's it's a it's a controversial, you know, debatable topic. 
Well, you know, we've had a lot of conversation about what happens in Shreveport that, you know, it was hard to find great barbecue. And I've had people, many, many, many people tell me that. Uh, so one of the things that has happened, one of the reviewers said we had the best brisket in northern Louisiana. So I just think that it happens to be the particular person who's working and trying to do what they're doing. Most of the big barbecue places buy gas-fired and electric-control ovens that you put a piece of wood into or a small amount of wood, and it generates a little bit of smoke. Well, a little bit of smoke does not make a lot of flavor. You need a lot of smoke to make a lot of flavor. So the difference in technology is pretty amazing to me. Now, I bought a grill from uh, Percy Guidry and Sons, and that grill is still operational, great grill, well manufactured, uh, great smoke coming from it, firebox was built with quarter inch steel, I mean it's just a wonderful grill. Now I can't imagine those guys, I promise you, those guys know how to build a grill, they know how to cook some barbecue. So it's just a matter of personal taste and operator who's dedicated, of course it's smoky, it's hot. You know, we have two grills out there, and sometimes it's 125 degrees, 130 degrees in the grill room. So they can do it cheaper without having the same kind of labor that we have to go through to make it right. But it just doesn't have the flavor. Somebody once said, if you don't love the people, you can't lead them. And I say, if you don't love the people, you shouldn't feed them. So it should be good or don't do it. Right. I never learned to play pool because I wasn't good at it. And things that I'm not good at, I don't want to do. I want to do things that I'm good at. And so when people smile and say they like the barbecue, that's how you get your feedback about love. Most of us get our determination of who we are from feedback. So they help make me a better barbecue guy. I'm kind of getting the feeling of why Chris Jay called you his spiritual advisor now. Do you think it's life lessons that made him that made you think that you're a good spiritual advisor? Like, how does that how does that feel that he considered you that? Well, I, I I work at trying to spread some good news. Most of the news we get is not good news. Even when I was a car dealer, I took a, a ad a uh, article out every Monday on the obituary page and said Harvey's thoughts. And I would just find quotes of good news to share. My job is to make it a better world. So I looked at it a lot and tried to figure out how can I help make somebody's day. And some of that happened. One time I had a service advisor when I was in the car business. They got mad at this woman because she was fussing and raising hell but she needed to hurry up and go. And the, the service of our very nice lady, grandmother, she said, I can't stand the woman. She's always got a problem. I said, who? I said, the lady's woman. What's wrong? I asked her, what's wrong? She said, my, my sons were mad at God because their sister died. And I buried her today. And I have to go home and get my kids. I couldn't even take them to the funeral. So I'm rushing. I went to Margaret. I said, Margaret. First of all, I gave her the keys to my car. I told her to go on. So Margaret, her, her daughter died. They had a funeral today. She's trying to go get her children off the bus from school. She said, if I had known that she was in that kind of trouble, I wouldn't have been upset. So you have to assume that when somebody's not having a great day, they need some help. And so why not try to make every day a helpful day? Try to make it a better day. Yeah. And so that's why we use the name Real Barbecue. Because most of the barbecue isn't real. At a Lincoln Mercury store that I named Greater Springfield. Because greater is he that is in you than is in the world. So I believe in God. God has shown me some miraculous things. And I know that he is powerful and wonderful. And he never leaves you in the cave by yourself. He takes you through the cave, not to the cave to leave you. Mr. Harvey, it has been a pleasure, and thank you so much for taking this time to sit down with me. It is my pleasure. You have such a nice smile, <laughs> wonderful personality. I'm so glad you're here. Thank you. Thank you. All, All right, right, that's our Let show. Me go thank you so out. much for tuning in. Join us next week, Sunday at 6 p.m. This is Tiffany Deku on News Talk 96.5 KPL, and this is the Lafayette Food Junkie Show. Thanks for listening, and as always, happy eating, Acadiana.